I'm Anthony William, the medical medium. You're listening to the Medical Medium Radio Show, where each week we talk about the most advanced healing information out there in chronic illness. And what's chronic illness? Any symptom that you're stuck with that you can't get rid of, that that a doctor's not helping you with, or anybody's not helping you with, or information on the internet, or anywhere else, or a healer, or any kind of practitioner is not giving you the answers, or the answers aren't helping when you receive the answers. That means you're living with some kind of symptom that's making you uncomfortable, and that's chronic illness. It's not just people that are literally in nursing homes on their deathbed, dying, you know, and they're in agonizing suffering. It's not just that group. Chronic illness is everybody right now. Everybody with a problem, with an issue, with a symptom, everybody. So that's where we are today in today's history, today's world right now, where it's, where, where it's come up to. And I'm providing answers to help people so you can alleviate that, get rid of that, move forward. Talking about the keto diet today. And you might think, hey, he's talking about the keto diet. So maybe he's talking about the keto diet being perfect for chronic illness. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about it that way. If you're a keto diet fan, you know, just stay on board, fasten your seatbelts, don't get your feelings hurt. I got a lot to talk about. There's a lot of information, the reality of the keto diet, how it got here, the history, why we're here now, the history of the low carb diet and what this means, what this means. So this is really important. And look, you could be vegan, you could be plant-based, you could be, you know, paleo, you can be animal protein and go with a keto diet. So everybody thinks But here's the most important point I'm going to drop on you right here before we even get started. It's almost impossible to be on a keto diet, even if you're on one, because you're getting sugar in your diet somewhere and not realizing it. And that's why the whole thing is basically a farce in a lot of ways, and we got to cover this. I knew I would be getting you guys riled up a little bit, anybody who's really, really pro-keto diet, but these are important points to understand. If you're eating one almond, you're not on a keto diet. It's impossible. There's sugar, naturally occurring sugars in almonds, walnuts, nuts, seeds. You can't go into ketosis if you're eating a nut butter or a nut. There's a sweetness in those nuts for a reason. Same as avocado. Avocado has sugar in it, natural sugars. It's a fruit. It just doesn't have fat in it. It has natural sugars in it. So we're going to go deep into this one. This is important. So is anybody even on a keto diet? Actually, not really and if you're doing dairy products, if you think you're on a keto diet diet and you're doing a cheese, you're doing a really healthy raw cheese or a butter, wrong again. Natural sugars, lactose, and so forth. You can't be into ketosis. You can't, your body can't go into ketosis if you're eating a dairy product. It's impossible. Same thing if you're eating an avocado. So if you're on a keto diet and avocados are allowed in that diet, you're not on a keto diet anymore. So what are you on? What are you doing? That's the whole point. Is it just a book you might have subscribed to that's titled The Keto Diet of some kind, but the, but the, the health professional or so-called expert doesn't even realize this? And you're eating an avocado or you're eating some nuts and seeds and they're filled with natural sugars and your body can't go into ketosis? Exactly. When you think about the reality of this, when you really look at what it is, you're going to sit back and be like, wow, you know what? I got to hear the rest of this, and I'm hoping you do. So fasten your seatbelts, get a cup of tea, anything, herbal tea or whatever you like. Relax, because this is a big deal, and this is a big one. Let's go into the history a little bit. Over the past several decades, there's been several different low-carb diets with different names, and then they build, and there's more different names and more diets. And I'm not going to go into the different names and start ripping apart the empires that have been built by these diets. Because, hey, you know, I'm not going to go into that. You can figure that out. You can do your own search out there and find all the different empires that have been built and the millions and hundreds of millions of dollars that have been made off of different names of diets. But the world has become so anti-sugar and anti-carb, it's, it's actually to its detriment. It's been, that's where we're at right now. Listen, it's become almost impossible to find experts in the field of health and wellness who don't shun a piece of fruit or a starchy vegetable. It's really sad, too, because what they don't know is they're taking away opportunities to heal. How did this even come to be? How did we even get here to begin with? A lot of trial and error by healthcare professionals, absolutely, and and you know, and also people that are in the industry, the health industry, in search for the best diet. 
Cutting out processed foods alone didn't seem to get most patients better. It didn't seem to get most everybody better. There had to be more than that. And over the decades, that's all that's really happened. We've cut out the processed foods. We cut out the bad foods, the fast foods, the greasy foods. But it didn't stop the countless symptoms and conditions people suffer with. So what to do next? Where do we go next? We got decades of this information of people trying to get off these foods, you know, health professionals trying to clean up their diets, but people still being chronically ill. And how do we feed people and keep them happy without taking all of their good stuff away or all of their fun foods away or all of their calories away? What do we do? Well, we're going to keep one thing in there. That's for sure. Professionals are not going to remove protein. No way. Because protein in our diet is what the, the entire medical model has been built on, built on on planet Earth. It's what it's all been based upon at least since 1933. At least since the 30s, it's been based upon that. And we can't change that. There's nothing we can do, especially in Western cultures. Protein remains an untouchable topic. You can't touch it. You can't dent it. You can't break it down. You can't throw it away. You can't keep it away from people. You can't keep the entire topic away from anybody. It's like it's part of everybody's existence because something happened in the older days. A deal was made, and we're going to go into this a little bit, a little bit about this. It's ingrained in us. Our great grandparents. That's what they were taught in school. They were taught. They were institutional about protein and how we'll diminish, we'll die, we'll disappear without protein. We'll, we'll completely just disappear off the face of the planet without getting our protein needs. It's not about anything else. It's not about any other needs or any other food needs. It's just about protein. And because of that, that's how we got here. So let's talk about how we even got here and let's go into the whole thing. The food industry combined with the government in the early 1930s to indoctrinate children in grammar schools is where this all started from. And then the higher grades across the country in the Protein Act. It was the Protein Act is what it was. It was the industrialized world in our food. It was no longer going to the butcher shop, and that's where you got a piece of meat. It became industrialized. It became taught in our schools that without protein, we cannot exist. Meanwhile, protein wasn't the top choice of food to keep people sustained. It wasn't the all food, meaning the animal protein wasn't the, the end all and the be all. There were so many other foods, so many other things to eat along the way. But basically, in the old alternative medicine, protein was never a law. That's another thing to know. So in the old alternative medicine, protein was never a law, but it was a law of consciousness in the regular conventional standard, the industry. And that's where it was. See, the alternative world, as far as the alternative healers of the day, they believed in fruits. They believed in leafy greens. They believed in herbs. They believed in vegetables, potatoes. They believed in nuts and seeds. They believed in all of these, those starchy vegetables, all of it. They didn't pay mind to protein because protein was in everything. It was everywhere. It's in spinach. It's in every single thing you eat. It's in every nut. It's in every seed. It's in all, it's in fruits. It's in everything we consume. There are proteins in everything and that's how it works. So it really wasn't a concern. It was conventional medicine, the very thing everybody's upset about right now, the very, every, the very thing everybody's afraid of. They're afraid of all the pharmaceuticals. They're afraid of all the drugs. They're afraid of all the things that pharmaceutical big pharma offers. Everybody's against big pharma and against all the conventional model, and they all want to go and search for all the alternative medicine and the plant medicine and all the secrets about health and everything, and they're all running from Guess what? They're running from the place that brainwashed their family line and their generations before them, that protein was law. So everybody's running away from the establishment that ingrained one thing that everybody's stuck with, that are keeping with and holding on to, and that's what's happening. So you can go alternative all you want. You can go alternative as far as you want. You can go and you can go into the Amazon and just try to live off of weeds. You can go somewhere else and try to live off of some more, something, some other kind of food. You can live off of coconuts on some island. You can go wherever you want. 
And you're going to believe still systemically in your consciousness, systemically in your being, you're go going to believe that protein keeps you alive, only protein, and that's what you exist on. You can't shake it. You can't get rid of it. It's in there and it's conventional. So when we think we escape the conventional model and the pharmaceutical world and everything else, we don't. We're married to it because protein is married to the conventional medical model. So if you think you're sitting there and you're eating all these, you know, herbs and you're doing all this and you're you're, you're drinking your kombucha tea and you're you're totally all spiritually you know inclined and you're you know sustainability and you're living all the way to your max of being alternative and off the grid in some way and you're you know you're hanging out and you're 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 on the beaches somewhere in another country and you're just like hey I'm living it up where I'm free from it if you believe in protein being law then you're not free from anything. It'll get you in the end when you get older, when you're 40 years old and you have your kids and you got to make sure they have enough protein and everybody has enough protein. And then you're going to be like, wait a minute, what do I eat? And next thing you know, it's, you're going to be eating more protein and it's all about protein and you can't escape it. No matter how much you think you cleaned yourself of the conventional model, the very thing you run from, conventional medicine is married to the protein law and it keeps us married to it. And when we, enter, when we entered the animal industry, when we entered the animal industrial age of meat processing and left the, you know, left the butcher market, left the old time butcher market, market and the old time farms, and we left all that and we entered that animal industry where, where it was all of that, the industry that never was there before, the meat packing industry, it worked in combined with the government. They all worked together. In the early 1930s, they all joined, they all joined forces in contractual business, grandfathered contracts that you can't pull out of vaults. You can't pull those babies out of vaults. It's not like today where you can dig up pretty much a contract on anything and anybody, even corporate contracts, you just dig them up. You just dig them up out of the woodwork, out of, you know, whatever, and they just show up. You can't, you can't get these out of the vaults. These are in banks, deep in vaults. These are, in tru these are entrusted, and they're grandfathered in. And these old contracts of government, okay, these old classified government contracts with, you know, that are combined with those, those very things were teaching, teaching children back in the 1930s and 40s that protein was law, that was joined forces with the pharmaceutical industry, business contractual agreements with big pharma and government, and the meatpacking industry. I'm not talking about the local butcher shop. I'm not talking about somebody's backyard farm where they're trying to, you know, survive and they got their free-range chickens. I'm not talking about that. And so ultimately indoctrinated the entire conventional medical industry in a decision that made sense momentarily. It made sense it, it made meat really cheap so people all walks of life can afford it. And that means less all of the other foods they did eat. And it, and it, and it put monetary interest before people's physical needs. And this isn't an anti-meat campaign. This isn't any of that. People who know my information and everything, I'm about delivering information, whether you're paleo, vegan, plant-based, whatever it might be, keto, whatever it is. But we're talking about the keto stuff today, and we're going to go into heav heavily into this. So let's go back into this. So these grandfathered contracts still exist. They're there. They're just not for public display. I want you to be able to make your own decisions. I want you free from, from these vaulted decisions that were made lifetimes before you, meaning your, your ancestry, that right down to your great-grandfather, that change your course of thinking so you stay brainwashed. That's what happens. And that's what goes on. And it's all part of what, what, why we create diets that are like ketogenic and so forth. And, you know, if you're pro-ketogenic, you might actually find this a really interesting show because it's not that I'm ripping apart anything. That's not at all. But wait till you hear the rest of this information. These were decisions made for us without any input for us. See, that's how it's done. Well, that's how Big Pharma does it. They make decisions for you all day long. You don't know it. They make future decisions for you that you don't know that you have to partake in later. No votes allowed. You're not, there's no town meetings. There's none of this. There's a woman or man. There's none of that. 
none of our knowledge or say whatsoever in private business deals that still hinder our lives because that's what they were. They're private business deals that hinder our lives and none of our knowledge to know about it, none of our say whatsoever to do anything about it, and it creates confusion decades and decades and decades later to where we are today. By the 1970s, and moving forward fast all the way into some history, by the 1970s, awareness occurred in the conventional medical system world that too much fat wasn't a good idea. And everybody's like, well, where's the fat come from? I don't understand. Where's it come from? It comes from the protein. Protein sources all are, are saturated in fat, even if it's healthy fat. So this positive awakening lasted for two seconds back in the 1970s. It's because medical doctors were getting upset. They were watching the heart disease rise. They were watching problems with their patients, the high blood pressure, the liver problems. And they knew it was from the animal proteins, the red meat. That's where the medical doctor stepped up and went against the big pharma, went against, I can't tell you how many times I heard this story from so many doctor friends where they were wined and dined by big pharma with steaks, wined and dined with steaks, take them all out to dinner. All the doctors that go out to dinner and all the NT, all that's, that's what they do. And then big pharma takes them out and they just, you know, they load them up with steaks. And you know, the thing is, is it's not that steak. Look, you might be into steak. It's all good. I'm all for whatever you're into, but I'm just telling you right now how this works. And there's the medical doctors of the 1970s that knew you had to lower people's fats to stop their pancreases from dying, to stop, to stop them from getting diabetes, to stop them from getting liver disease, to stop them from getting high blood, blood pressure, the cholesterol problems, heart disease. Too much fat was bad for the heart. That was deemed correct in the 1970s. It was profound. It was a profound discovery that, was exec that wasn't executed properly. It was a profound discovery that wasn't respected or looked after. The potential for progress fell apart. It evaporated. Every decade that goes by, everybody forgets about the history before, and no one cares to learn about what happened before. It turned into a low-fat trend that made no sense in the 70s. So what happens is it had, it had potential in the 1970s when medical doctors realized that too much fat was killing their patients. And we're talking about healthy fats, too. And they knew it, but... What they did was they decided to lower people's fats. It was like a trend for a little while in the 1970s. But it was done wrong because low-fat diets of that day were actually still extremely high in fat, and that's why it was done wrong. These diets increased portions of animal protein of all kinds, all kinds, including you know, all kinds of meats, while having the illusion of being lower fat. And that's why it fell apart. And they were stay, they, everybody stayed away from avocados. See, back in the 1970s, when, everybody, when the doctors realized that high fat, which was high protein, was killing their patients, it's a profound discovery, first time in our history, when they realized it, after watching the last so many decades before them in the 1970s of patients getting sick from the meat accumulation being in people's diets, they decided, look, we have to lower fats. So they made avocados. They were like avocados being poisonous. That You can't have avocados. That's bad for you in the 70s. You can't do coconut oil. It's bad for you. Got to stay away from too much nuts. You got to stay away from peanut butter. Got to stay away from nut butters. Got to stay away from olives. Got to stay away from all these things. So all of the healthy fats were removed from everybody's diet back in the 70s. And instead, an increase of meat was brought in. The low-fat and fat-free products lined shelves too, but they were unhealthy products, reportedly low-fat and fat-free, but weren't. People thought they were triumphing over, they thought they were actually rising above and, and you know, out of everything. They were avoiding the lard. They were avoiding the, avoiding the sugar, the chocolate cake, the chocolate cookies in the 70s. They were avoiding it all. Only the problem was they replaced it with more animal protein, which is filled with fat. And doctors were confused. They're trying to remove all these bad fats. They're trying to remove fats and good fats. They're trying to remove avocados, coconut oil. They're trying to remove olives. They're trying to remove nuts and seeds and you know, the healthy fats. But they were the only thing they had left 
was just more animal protein and more animal protein and no carbs. That's what was starting to develop. This is the birth, the beginning of the ketogenic diet I'm talking about right out of the 70s here. What made these the highest fat diets ever without anybody realizing it was the fact that the increase of the meats occurred and the removal of avocados and all these other things were removed. It was a great mistake that was ignored and it's still ignored now. They didn't realize that animal protein translates to animal fat. That was the one big mistake. See, we turned a blind eye to the reality that there's any fat in animal protein. We still actually don't believe there's any fat in animal protein. I mean, we have this term now that's starting to develop right now. I'll go into it a little bit. It's called lean meats. Make sure you do lean meats. Lean meats? What, what do you have to do lean meats? Well, they got to be lean meats. That developed. What, what, do you, what do you mean? There's fat in our meat? So wait a minute. We have lots of fat in our meat. You see, you see where it's going? There's some doctors now, they're like, oh, lean meats, oh, lean meats, because they watch their patients get sick. And that's how it works. And the goal to begin with in the early 1930s, the master plan in the 1930s, was to make sure we focus as protein as the law so you have to ignore the fat content, and it worked. You have to ignore the fat content in animal protein and because it's protein, that's the master plan that was ingrained in, us, ingrained in us since the 1930s. So when you grow up with your parents and grandparents are focused on protein, it's a rule you can't escape. It's a rule you can't hide from or run from. Somehow the word protein takes us over as if we've been bitten by a zombie and it just completely overrides common sense and reality and any kind of proper information and any kind of truth. It completely overrides every last bit of it. And guess what? You've been duped. We've all been duped. I cover this in full detail in my book, Liver Rescue. Make sure you take care of your liver, learn about your liver, and make sure you get it better. And if you don't think you have a sick liver, if you have any symptoms and conditions, it comes from the liver, all of them. There's a myriad of diet programs and food belief systems out there that have been renamed and reshaped, but in the end, they're high fat. Over and over again, they get repackaged, the same concept, over and over again. A high-protein, low-carb diet with a new name, for example, like the keto diet. That's an example. It's just another anti-carb, anti-sugar, extremely high-fat eating plan. They're just, they're just repackaged, slightly upgraded versions of the high-protein diets of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Today's, today's high-protein diets have more greens more green juices, maybe a berry in there, maybe a little avocado, some avocado, or even lots of nuts. Because in the early days, people suffered from the early low-carb diets because they didn't have these healing foods in them, and it destroyed their health. It destroyed their health. Sure, taking away fast foods and nuts, taking away fat, fast foods and all the donuts, and all the other things people eat in the cakes and, and all the, the grease that people ate in the lard and all that, taking that away and giving them more and more and more clean animal meat and more and more clean animal meat was a good idea to a point, but in the end, still wreaks havoc and still kills them quickly. Because the reason why is you don't have these other foods that are giving you that nutrition that are actually really fortifying you, the antioxidants, all the minerals, the trace minerals, all the different vitamins and nutrients, all of them. People were missing in the older days. The older no-carb diets literally meant meat, meat, meat three times a day with maybe a few sparse vegetables here and there. And people suffered greatly for it and paid the price. And guess what? No one cares because it was years ago and we forget every five years. It used to be 10 years and you needed need 10 years to go by before we forget about history. Now we only need three years. For some reason, something's happening so fast in the world right now. If it's three years ago, it's just don't, not even worth even understanding. It's crazy how it works. Now we have YouTube and the internet, social media, and people are doing a much better job of recording now. We didn't have that back then. But what's interesting is if you watch everybody in YouTube and the internet and social media, and if you watch them long enough, you will see a pattern. They end up gaining their weight back. Or you'll see them come down with symptoms and conditions like eczema or psoriasis later on down the road. So you have to realize something. 
we're re- everybody's recording their history now on YouTube and social media. So you can see what's going on for the future versus like in the past when none of that existed or happened. So for example, five years from now, what's somebody going to be struggling with? They have more different symptoms, conditions. They tried all these different low carb diets to no carb diets, and they're still getting all these different problems. In fact, it's happening now. There are people that are on YouTube that a year later, they're switching to a different diet then to a different diet, different low carb diet, another low carb diet. And they're looking for answers. They're experimenting and they're already getting symptoms and conditions, whether it's weight gain or they're getting an actual symptom like a neurological problem for the first time or high anxiety or something. And they're confused. Is it the diet? Is it not? Is this diet right or is it wrong? But that's because there's so much information and that's the whole thing. The reason why the medical medium series books, because there's viruses, there's bacteria, all of these different things. There's toxic heavy metals. And it's not just about, hey, protein, protein being some answer or some heralded answer, like godly answer, it's protein, or it's not just, or it's not just low carb, low carb, low carb. But yet we're going to have documents now, documents of people doing their YouTubes. And what is it going to be like 10 years from now? We're going to be able to see back 10 years before when they were younger. And now they're getting older in their 30s. And their low-carb diet might not have done good for them because all of a sudden their liver is going into big problems because of all that high fat. And they got all – and exercising two hours a day doesn't keep it away. Doing yoga for one hour a day, then being in the gym, cycling for another hour a day. And all this isn't all of a sudden keeping it at bay as you're reaching 31 years old, 32 years old, 33 years old. And you have this documented history that never existed before. Unlike instead – being in the, being out there, like for instance, me and many other practitioners all through these years, watching decades of this happening and knowing some of this history from the past, that the low carb diets weren't all what it's all cracked up to be. So we're going to go into this. And why does it work for some people temporarily, but did not work for most people, did not work for most people? How come that happens? Because what happens is you're getting off of all the bad food, all the college food you might have been trained to be on, all the pizzas and all of that, and you might be off of that. You might be giving up all of your fast food, all of that stuff, all the greasy food, all of those things, and you're giving it all up, and you're you're more now maintaining your diet, a healthier diet. You still got the fats in there. You still got the clean you know, protein, animal proteins. You still got some other things, maybe some juices and other things like that. And you're losing some weight. You're cleaning things in. You're cleaning things up. You're actually getting some toxins out. And it could be helping you temporarily. And the reason why, it's helping your liver temporarily. And we have to cover why so many people struggle with weight gain, insulin resistance, and blood sugar issues to begin with. And how people are eating high-protein, high-fat diets by nature, and it's not even fixing it. Or they're eating high-fat, high-protein diets by nature along with lots of processed sugar. And sure, you take away the processed sugar and you got rid of one bad thing, the processed sugar. You got rid of one culprit and one big culprit. So then all of a sudden your diet got cleaner. And so when it got cleaner, your insulin, your insulin resistance dropped a little bit. So I'm going to go into all this by detail. You know, we never, here's the thing. We are never just eating sugar or carbohydrates ever by itself. Remember that. So it's not like sugar's the devil. And, and we're only eating sugar. Who's on an only candy diet where it's a candy diet that has no fats in it? I'm not talking about a milk chocolate that has, it's loaded with fat and sugar. Who's on a candy diet and only a candy diet? Because donuts have fat in them. Cakes have fat in them. Cupcakes, um, all of that. Cookies have fat in them. Everything has fat in it. Who eats pasta plain with nothing on it? They put fat on it. They put butter on it, butter on their pasta. They put sauce on their pasta, sauce with fat in it. They put, and if you want Chinese food or something like that, and you want you want different foods and different um, kinds of, of cooking, you put um, sesame oil on it or peanut oil on it or soy oil, soy oil on it. Either way, it's fats on your pasta. It's the whole thing. It never was the sugar. Who's on just sugar alone? Nobody. Nobody's on just sugar alone. So, but he, nobody would know sugar's the problem ever. They would never be able to figure it out because nobody's on, no one's on sugar alone. The combination of sugar and fat, that's where it all goes wrong. Together, they clash. Sugar became the, the scapegoat, you see? All forms of sugar being deemed bad while keeping in all of the fats as being all good. All the fats are great. 
They take the sugar out of the diet and keep the fat in. That's how it works. And, the, and here's the bottom line. You know what happens when you do that? You get some results. You get rid of all the sugar. You think you found the crown and glory. You think you found, you think you, literally you think an angel just appeared out of the sky and delivered you a holy crown and put it on your head. Because when you, when you actually remove all the sugar, something changes where you get this temporary relief. You get a little bit of weight loss. Some other things could happen. But wait a minute. The more fat you eat, you get in trouble. That's right. And you'll even see some YouTubers knowing that they have to start minimizing their calories now because too much meat on its own is still not getting their weight down. Confusion, huh? Confusion. It wasn't just the sugar being the bad guy. See? And see, A1C levels can drop, but they can drop in a false light. They can drop in a false light when you remove sugar and you just keep it high fat, high fat, high fat. Diabetes can improve for people. Prediabetes can disappear sometimes when people remove the sugars, but they keep the fats in. But it doesn't fix it all together because the minute you bring in that sugar one bit, boom, that A1C goes up. Boom, diabetes just all of a sudden appears out of nowhere because it never went away. The liver was a problem still. That's why you need the liver rescue book. It's critical. I talk about the diabetes in there. And see, that's, that's how it works. And it led the blaming to the wrong culprit. It led the, it, it put the blame on the sugar. And you know what happened then? We just didn't remove the bad sugar, the corn syrup. We didn't remove that. And the candy, you know, the bad processed sugar and the beet sugar, the processed GMO beet sugar. We didn't remove all that. We removed the good sugar. We removed the sweet potato. We, we, we removed the regular potato, the purple potato, the red potato, the brown potato, the russet, the gold. We removed all kinds of things. We removed carrots. We removed everything. We removed fruit. We removed all kinds of fruit, almost all fruit. And so what happened was we removed the healthy sugar, thinking that's the answer. We lump sugar as all the same. And that's one of the great mistakes right there that was made. The problem was fat and sugar combined. And that was the problem. And you know, the bottom line, the bottom line, it's like having sweet barbecue sauce on fatty ribs. It's like having milk in your mashed potatoes. It's like having cream in your mashed potatoes. It's like having corn on the cob with butter. You got your sugar, the corn, you got your butter, you got the fat. You put them together, you got insulin resistance. You, the culprit isn't the corn, even though corn actually isn't good, <laughs> okay? It's a GMO crop at this point. It's not good. It's not good. But it was never the real culprit. <laughs> the culprit was the butter. Same thing with pork and rice. The culprit wasn't the rice. The rice is actually not so bad. The culprit was the pork, kills the liver, kills the pancreas, and it stresses, it stresses the pancreas out to such a degree you get the insulin resistance, and that's what happens over time. But everybody, hey, get rid of the rice, you keep the pork. That's what happens. Get rid of the corn, you keep the butter. That's what goes on. Get rid of, you know, that's what it is. And so we, we have to realize what's going on here. It's like bread and butter. It wasn't the bread that was the worst situation or the worst case scenario. It was the butter and bread combined. And bread isn't good. I'm not saying gluten is good. No, it's not. Gluten feeds pathogens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And by the way, that information only came from the medical medium information. Because till this day, nobody knew gluten fed pathogens until the information was brought to town from spirit. It's very important to know that. So this leads to insulin resistance is what it leads to when you put bread and butter together. But you take the butter out, you don't get the insulin resistance with bread by itself. Of course, bread's not good. It's going to feed a pathogen. But guess what? Butter, butter feeds bacteria. Butter feeds viruses. Butter feeds pathogens. You put them both together, now you have a real pathogen feeder. You really get sick. The bottom line is it leads to insulin resistance because there is too much fat in the blood 
when we have too much fat in the blood and then we have all that fat and we're still eating fat and we're eating fat combined with sugar, while we have all this fat in the blood, the body tries to get rid of the sugar. It tries to get the sugar into the cells, but it can't because it needs the sugar in the cells. Your cells have to have sugar in them in order for you to survive, talk, walk, live, breathe, exercise. The fat blocks the sugar from entering the cells. And insulin's produced to try to stop this. And then you just have nothing but a roadblock and nothing but resistance with all that fat in the bloodstream. And that's what happens. The sugar ends up getting trapped in the bloodstream and then you get, that's the resistance that occurs and your A1C goes up and your liver starts to bonk out. So when we take the sugar out, we're not having so much insulin resistance. It's still there. It still exists, but it's hidden. And we experience other things instead inside our body. The body starts running out of sugar because our body runs on sugar. When it runs out of sugar, we end up getting in trouble in a whole different way. See, our bodies are not meant to run on fat. They don't run on fat. They actually run on glucose. Glucose. Glucose is what keeps you alive. Any sensible doctor knows that. It's amazing. You see a lot of these professionals out there now touting out their books, going on talk shows, going on podcasts, like they're experts. And they're talking about high fat and keto, and they're talking about lots of fats and healthy fats. Meanwhile, they know in the back of their mind that without glucose, we die. Without glucose, we can't function, we can't exist, we can't live, we can't think, we can't breathe, we can't do anything without glucose. But they're inundating us with all this fat because it's the trend. And trends like that, they get us in trouble. See, we need antioxidants, phytochemicals. We need phytochemical compounds. We need living water. We need trace minerals. We need all these nutrients, vitamins, and fresh fruits, vegetables, coconut water, honey, starchy vegetables. We need things in there to keep us healthy. And we can't get that from just animal sources or just fats of all kinds. We can't get that from just fats. The body goes into survival mode with that much fat coming in, looking for these nutrients desperately. And so... What your body tries to do is it tries to save your life. It tries to expel the fat through digestion. The liver itself tries to collect it. It tries to store it. It tries to, to hide it from us. That's what it does. The fat is lowering the amount of oxygen in our blood so that our heart gets less oxygen, our brain gets less oxygen because the fat is lowering oxygen. That's what it does. High fat diets, lower oxygen. Sure, you could be on this high-fat diet, you're exercising in the gym, you're, doing, you're some guy and you're in the gym, you're doing two hours a day in the gym, and you're, just, you're building some muscle, you're watching what you're eating, you're eating all your animal fats, you're eating all your different fat, or you're vegan, you're eating all your plant fats. This, has, this isn't an anti-animal campaign, it's not an anti-vegan campaign. There's no such, not, no such thing in the medical medium information, it's about the information, and you could apply it to whatever you're in and whatever you're doing. So that's how it works. But when you get that lack of oxygen over time, you die of the heart attacks down the road. You get the strokes down the road. The heart and the brain environment. See, here's what happens. The lack of oxygen to the heart and the brain means viruses thrive in low oxygen so they can take over down the road, create more problems. The adrenals are shooting off adrenaline to try to keep you clear, to try to push the fat away, to try to clean up your blood, to save your heart and your brain. The adrenals do that. These are the immediate effects of eating high-fat, high-protein diets, whether it's vegan, whether it's animal protein. The immediate effects are the body's producing adrenaline to try to save your life. People tend to do intermittent fasting with keto diets because they notice they feel better. Because if they did eat fat three times a day, they fall apart. Think about that. So you might be into intermittent fasting, ketogenic-wise. You don't want to eat carbs. Instead, you're on caffeine all day. Caffeine, caffeine. You know, you know what I noticed, which is unbelievable? All the people who aren't really struggling with any kind of illnesses, any kind of chronic illness, and actually know what it's like when you take away something so critical like a coconut water or, or a little bit of honey or a piece of fruit because they need that glucose for their nervous system. And you get somebody who doesn't have that problem yet. Viruses haven't done anything in their bodies yet. They're young or something's going on where they're not dealing with that. And they're able to just intermittent fast. No problem. And then they could eat their animal protein at the end of the day. They live off of chocolate and caffeine. Just chocolate, chocolate all day long. That's what they do. 
They drink all their caffeine drinks of all kinds. You know, their matcha lattes, their green teas, their chocolate, their coffee. And they're just on that all day long intermittent fasting. And they notice they start feeling better because if they ate meat three times a day, they'd get sluggish and tired because guess what? They'd be losing their oxygen. And if they ate avocados three times a day, so just forget the meat thing, okay? What if you're vegan? You're eating avocados and nuts three times a day, four times a day, and you're just doing that. And you're just minimizing your oxygen levels. You're lowering your oxygen levels because the fats don't get a chance to clear out of your bloodstream so that more oxygen can enter into your bloodstream and get to your brain and heart. So you gotta be, so people are intermittent fasting and they're running on adrenaline instead. So they're jump, dumping all this caffeine in their system and adrenaline is flooding and flooding and they're, they're, they're literally high off of caffeine and adrenaline because there's no carbohydrates in their system to give them energy. So they're getting all their energy instead of carbohydrates and sugar where people get their energy, which is like healthy sugar and healthy carbohydrates. Instead of getting energy from there, everybody's like getting energy from caffeine drinks and caffeine and chocolate. And then... They're getting energy from their adrenaline. But how long can that last? And if you do YouTube for 10 years, I'd like to see what's happening 10 years on that very program. Caffeine for 10 years. I'd love to see that. And then maybe you pick up a couple of new bugs too along the way from a relationship or you pick up some new bugs from a restaurant, from eating out somewhere or whatever it is. And you got a new variety of strep in your system that you picked up. And it's starting to give you UTIs and it's starting to give you problems and starting to give you sinus congestion and migraines and all these other things. Or you pick up some new heavy metals, a new bout of heavy metals, and you're intoxicated by that. And, you know, and, and you're getting all this stuff in your system. And 10 years later, your caffeine drinks and, and, and your chocolate all day long and your intermittent fasting of all that. And then you're eating your high-fat dinner isn't quite saving you anymore as you're 32 years old now instead of 22 years old now. And you got a history of this on YouTube. People don't realize what's coming, and it already is. You see it out there every day. You know, you don't, you don't need the internet or YouTube to really, you know, to see it. If you're in the, if you're in the field of decades of helping people heal, I talked to doctors that have been, you know, they're working, they've been working on people for 40 years. I'm going 30 plus years. I've been helping people and, you know, I've seen it all. And, and I've talked to doctors that have seen it all. I've talked to health professionals and scientists and, and lab technicians and everything else. They've watched what happens when you're on caffeine and you're not eating anything for half the day and you're just on caffeine and you're just on chocolate. And that's, you know, and, and it ends up getting everybody because the body quickly loses its adrenaline storage. It loses, it loses its glycogen storage too. Your adrenals start to weaken. It can't keep you going anymore. Your glycogen storage, which is your sugar storage, starts to dissipate throughout your body, throughout your liver, throughout your body, throughout your brain. And it leads to other symptoms because every cell in your body runs on sugar. So if you're starving your body of healthy sugars and you're doing high fat, high fat, high fat, and you're just, and you're not eating anything but chocolate, sure, you might get some sugar thrown in there every now and then because you know what people do? They end up binging anyway. <laughs> That's the other thing too. They end up binging on something. That's the whole point. They end up hitting like they binge on carb rich foods. Because the brain and liver say, it's, you know what? No more. Your heart, your brain, you need glucose. You need sugar. You will or will force you to do it and you will binge. And because you're starving yourself, you're starving yourself. Because fats can't fuel everything. They can't. Even though they're binging on fats along with the carbs, that then keeps the cycle going. So when you're binging on fats along with the carbs, you keep the cycles going. Where now you're still not getting enough sugar to your cells. You're getting insulin resistance. Instead of taking the fat out or lowering the fat and bringing in the healthy carbs and watching the weight drop while you're exercising and watching things change, that's what really matters right there, especially if you're chronically ill and you're struggling or suffering. The high fat, high fat, high fat with chronic illness is only a temporary fix when you just came from a fast food diet and a standard American diet and you're going from there and getting rid of all the junk and going right to, say, a keto clean diet or right to a high protein, no carb diet. You start feeling better right away. But if you're going long term that way, your cells start to starve because there's so much fat in the bloodstream preventing sugars from getting into the cells. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us alive. That's what happens here. You get insulin resistance. It's constant insulin resistance. 
And then if the sugar is in your diet too at the same time, you get more insulin resistance, your A1C goes up, you get problems, you get other issues going on, you get mood swings, you're up and down all over the place. And then a practitioner or a well-meaning doctor or a well-meaning you know, dietitian or somebody will be like, remove all sugar. Remove all sugar. You should be on healthy chicken and some vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. You should be on this and this and that's it. And or if it's a vegan practitioner or a vegan somebody who's, you know, or a vegan trainer or somebody's in, they'll just be like plant-based. They'll be like, you should be on avocados. You should be on your nut and seed smoothies. You should be on lots of peanut butter in your smoothies. You should have peanut butter on your, you know, all of that going on. And then that's happening there. Or they'll just say, have peanut butter on your oatmeal. But what's that? That's sugar oatmeal with your fat peanut butter and you still end up with insulin resistance. So the bottom line is everybody's fighting for their lives and they don't realize it. They don't. But when you're healthy and you have reserves enough and you're strong enough and you weren't compromised enough early on in life, you weren't injured somehow emotionally and physically. You weren't weakened along the way. You didn't have to work in a factory, a chemical factory. Maybe you weren't doused with fungicide because you lived next to a farm where airplanes dropped fungicide on everything. Maybe you weren't, maybe you had opportunities to stay healthier You had a loving family always looking out for you. All these things that gave you chances to have stronger reserves that other people may not have. And in those stronger, and maybe you had less viral, viral pathogenic exposure, maybe less viruses. Maybe you didn't contract different varieties of Epstein-Barr and all kinds of different bugs and viruses and all these different things. Or maybe you just didn't, maybe you don't have much going on. Your pathogenic load is really low and you're lucky and you're not dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, you know, lupus, all from Epstein-Barr, and you're not dealing with all these different conditions and medical medium informations helping so many people recover and change their lives and get rid of in their life. And maybe you're not one of those. And you got, you're strong enough to handle the ups and downs of all the misinformation where you go, where you're intermittent fasting on chocolate and you're just, or you're just no carb for a while and you're bouncing back and forth and you're working out in the gym, but we're still all, our bodies and us are all literally trying to stay alive within the misinformation nonstop until you get older and who breaks first? Who breaks first? Is it the person in their late 20s because they were more compromised with more viruses, bacteria, and more toxic heavy metals and more difficult problems and maybe difficult hard times and adrenaline problems because of breakups and relationships and maybe something happened? Or is it the person who goes a little bit further and things go further and it happens to them at 40? They start getting the hot flashes. They start getting the heart palpitations. They start getting all the different anxiety, the, the insomnia and problems, and they start getting diagnosed with Lyme disease. Or is it the person that goes even further and they don't break yet? And they go till they're 60, and all of a sudden they get their first beginning stroke. They're, you know, they get their ischemic attack, their first whatever, and they get their first bout of you know, multiple sclerosis, whatever it is. Maybe it's a person that goes even a little further. But the point is, is we're all literally trying to survive in a land of confusion and misinformation with diets that aren't giving us what we need entirely because we don't understand how they work, how the body works, or anything of the sort. It's incredible. And that's how, that's what's happening. So let's go into it a little bit. Are you really in ketosis with a ketogenic diet? Are you going into ketosis? Is that even possible? Not if there's an avocado in there. It's impossible. If you're on a vegan diet and you're saying you're on a keto, you subscribe to a keto vegan diet, it's impossible. Impossible. If you eat one nut, there's sugar in that nut. You can't. If you eat, if you eat one nut, if you eat avocado, there's sugar in avocado. Not, not avocados are sweet. They're actually sweet. They're they're tasty. There's a sweetness to it. There's sugar in avocado. You can't go into ketosis. It's impossible. Instead, you have a sugar and fat combination. There's no way to go into ketosis. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what any urine test says or a blood test or anybody says. It's impossible. You can't go into ketogen. You can't go into ketosis. And if you're a vegetarian and you eat one little pat of butter, you're not going into ketosis either. There's little traces of, there's traces of sugar in butter. Butter's sweet. It actually has a sweet flavor to it. Anything like the dairy, any cheese, any kind of raw cheese has, has lactose in it. It's impossible to go into ketogenic, it, into ketosis. Sorry about that. It's impossible to go into that kind of thing where the ketones, you cannot, here's the bottom line. You can't really be on a ketogenic diet. That's the irony. You can't. If you had oatmeal 
one time that week, you're not on a ketogenic diet. If you had peanut butter that week, you're not on a ketogenic diet. If you had avocado, you're not on a ketogenic diet. See? Unless you're on bacon, bacon, bacon three times a day, and then you die fast. Unless you're on bacon and meat three times a day, and you just live on that, and then, yes, you can go into ketosis. You literally can starve of sugar. For, you starve because you, you run out of sugar reserves and you starve. And here's the thing. We don't burn our fats when we go into ketosis. That's, one, that's, not, that's why you're not, that's not why you're losing fat. You're not losing weight because you're in some kind of ketogenic thing going on. When you're into ketosis, that's not how it works. No, that's not how it works. If that's the case, then if you were somebody that was really overweight, you would never be able to starve to death. You couldn't starve somebody to death. You take their food away, they could live forever. They have so much fat on their body, they could just live so long. They could live forever without food. And it's not possible to starve to death and starve to death fast. Absolutely. You better believe it because the fat doesn't convert into, into usable material. It doesn't. It disperses, yes. It dissolves, you pee it out. You get rid of it, yes. If somebody has fat on them, if they have fat on them, you can't, you can't take away their food and, and, and think their fat's going to convert. Can, actually, it's going to convert into something that's usable, usable in the body to keep them alive. It's not possible. It's another huge mistake. Unbelievable, the information that's out there. It just makes your head spin. And you just wonder, I mean, who's in charge out there? It's, 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 it's incredible. If you want to follow something that is long-term and going to help you heal and stay healthy, you need the CCCs. I talk about that in Liver Rescue, the critical clean carbohydrates, like I share in Liver Rescue and my celery juice book. You need that. You need the mineral salts from the greens, the leafy greens, lots of leafy greens, spinach, mush. You need the red leaf lettuce, the butter leaf lettuce. You need the green leaf lettuces. You need the dandelion greens. You need all that. You need the herbs, the parsley, the cilantro. You need the mineral salts from all of those. You need the celery juice. It's critical and lots of it. That's what you need. Sure, you can have a little bit of avocado if you're plant-based. Sure, you can have a little bit of tahini. If you're into animal products, you're into the paleo stuff, you're into whatever it is, sure, you can have a little piece of meat. Sure, you can have a little bit of meat or you can have, you know, whatever, a little bit of fish if you like fish. But you don't want to overdo it. You want to up all of those but leave everything down low, meaning all the good stuff. But you want to up, up all the nuts and seeds and avocados and you want to up all the meats and all the fish and you want to up all the cheese and you want to up all the butter and put the butter in your coffee and you want to up everything. You want to up all that stuff. You're just going to get yourself in trouble along the way. And sure, you're probably doing a juice, a green juice, because the plant-based movement, what happened was, it's interesting, the ketogenic diet was really hurting people bad. The no-carb diet of the 70s before it was even called ketogenic, the no-carb diets were hurting people. They were hurting them bad. And the high-fat, high-fat was hurting them bad. And so as the years gone by, in order to get somebody now symptom, at least reduce their symptoms, We've had to bring in the green juice in their no-carb diet. We had to bring in avocado in their no-carb diet. We had to bring in nuts and seeds in their no-carb diet. We had to bring other things in there and different and even small, for even some fruits like tomatoes and other things we've had to bring into some of these no-carb diets because we give them more sugars, more fuels, more trace, mineral, more trace minerals, more antioxidants, and we start getting them better. So the new keto diets of today, you'll see the, like the cover of the books and the cover of this and the cover of whatever, the, all this stuff. You'll see it's all these other different vegetables with a couple of different fruits in there and some avocados and all this stuff and some nuts and some seeds. You'll see a different variety of things that have sugar in it because we're not on ketogenic diets anymore. We're not on just no carb. It doesn't exist. We're bringing that plant-based food into it to save the ketogenic's life, meaning the ketogenic diet's life, to save the no-carb lives, to save, to save the lives of these diet programs, not the lives of people necessarily too, but them too, and then but the programs themselves and the empires so people don't get so sick and run from it with their heads spinning. Listen, bottom line is lower your fats, learn about how your liver works, bring that celery juice in, Learn at least a couple of things that are critical. Get the Liver Rescue book, the, the Celery Juice book. 
Anyway, I love you guys. I say, you know, we'll do the best we can, get this information out there, and um, take care. Bless your heart.